It's good to see everyone this morning. We're going to be in Psalm 8. Very profound. There's only nine verses. But it, the, the things it calls upon you to think through uh, are as profound as anything that occurs in Scripture. And so I want us to give uh, good, careful attention to that. And, uh, Psalm... Eight. It's good to see each of you. I bring you greetings from the congregation in Linda Vista and uh, the brethren at ITL at the school and Brother Benny Monteca who translates and we just teach the class together basically. Uh, sends his greetings and his thanksgiving for the considerations that some of the brethren have shown to him. Uh, he's doing, seems to be doing well losing sight progressively, but he is, uh, he is going, to, going to school learning Braille, and he's learned how to use the, the cane for people that are seeing impaired, and he's learned how to use that very effectively, and so we're thankful for that. Uh, Y'all don't tell him I said this. He's a proud man, and so to give in to that, have to use that cane has been a thing that he had to come to grips with. But he's there, and he's doing it, and we're grateful for that. He's a good, good friend, and I uh, treasure him in a lot of ways. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Lord, we give thanks for this beautiful day. We're thankful for the refreshing rains that have come to us in the time that we needed it, and we're grateful uh, for all the ways that you now and have in the past cared for us and show your concern for humanity. Uh, we pray that you would forgive us where we've erred and been negligent and unmindful of those around us and of your presence and your mercy to us. And be with us as we consider this psalm and help us to think deeply uh, and devotedly uh, about the things that are revealed here. We're thankful for your servant that brought it to us under the inspiration of the servant uh, of the Spirit. We pray that you continue with us through this period and through our worship hour. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to just read the psalm, then we'll talk a little bit of introduction and just proceed as we have, if that's all right. If it isn't all right, I'll let you do it. <laughs> uh, that's supposed to have been a joke. I try to stay away from comedy because I'm not very good at it. Uh, it has a superscription, The Lord's Glory and Man's Dignity for the Choir Director on the Gatith, uh, a Psalm of David. I say it every time, maybe by the time we get through the Psalms, we'll all have it down as these things are not inspired, but they are very ancient, and there's not really any reason to uh, to doubt them, and, uh, and so we, we present it to you as a very ancient observation that's been made by the ones that's collected the material for us. Uh, verse 1, O oh Lord, our Lord. How majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The superscription you see for the choir director, it says they had in the temple worship, they had singers, they had uh, choirs, they had instruments, had a lot of things that we don't have today. But he gives some, uh, some instruction there on the Gatith. Well, what in the world is that? I don't know, and you don't either. Uh, a Psalm of David is what he says, and so the, the, it's, a, it's a mizmor, which means it is a psalm by, for, or to David. Um, and it is obviously intended to express uh, praise from the very deepest level. And it's become one of the most well-known uh, expressions of adoration towards God in the entire book of Psalms. 
therefore an entire Bible, really. Uh, it is described for the choir director. It's a Hebrew word about that long that I can't pronounce. On the getit. Well, that word, we don't know what it means. It's also found in uh, Psalm 81 and Psalm 84 in the introduction. And uh, there are a number of things it could mean. Uh, it's derived from the word gath and has been variously interpreted. It could be interpreted uh, to uh, indicate the accompaniment of some kind of instrument that it originated in the Philistine city of Gath. It could be a Gittite uh, melody, maybe associated with Gittite guard and their march in 2 Samuel 15, verse 18. Uh, and since the word Gath or Goth means uh, wine press in Hebrew, it may be a t the tune of a vintage song whenever, you know, pressing, pressing the grapes. We don't know. Uh, several different hymns appear in the Psalms, but amongst all of them, there's a similar structure and they're easy to spot. They begin with a call to worship and then continue to expand on why it is that we should worship and then often conclude with a further invitation to worship. Call to worship, reasons why, and call to worship. This hymn follows that basic pattern, uh, beginning and ending with an invitation to worship God, verse 1, verse 9. And by having as its body an elaboration on why uh, a worship should be given to the Lord, it follows, as I've said, that typical, typical organization and you can recognize them. You can also recognize a Hebrew hymn because it is uh, exuberant in its praise of God. Uh, they, they, um, they're not afraid to express the kind of exaltation that they feel for the majesty and the grandeur and the glory of the Lord. Uh, I remember Dr. Jack Evans one time was at Freed Hardeman, and the brethren were... Uh, fussing and arguing a little bit about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and doing some hair splitting. And uh, <laughs> Brother Evans said, man, you white people need to lighten up a little bit, you know, and accept what the Bible says and move on. And, you know, he's called on everybody, don't, don't, let's, don't, let's don't get in the weeds so much that we just miss what's there. And I thought that was good advice then and do, do now. And so... David sees this magnificent shining array. You know, when, whenever you're out far enough that there's no light pollution, there's a lot of stuff up there, a bunch of stuff. Herschel's from West Texas. I'm sure he's, you know, he's seen it. Uh, we'd go out to Lubbock sometime, get out away from town a little bit, and man, uh, what a sight that he, he displays every night. And uh, then when that moon is full and, and wrapped in, a, in golden light, uh, that's pretty impressive too when you see it, uh, see one of those harvest moons. It's just big, big, big in the sky. And uh, so he sees that and he's sitting and, and reflecting and is swept into a, a silent but a powerful worship service as he's seeing all of that. And he, he listens quietly and he looks thoughtfully at this sermon on God. Well, how's it a sermon on God? Somebody put it there. I mean, you either, you either are forced to say, well, it just happened, or recognize that it was put there, and it's put there with design and purpose and meaning, which it obviously displays. Uh, you know, you get to digging into that, and before long, you're off into deep water. It's pretty complex what the Lord put in place and sustains. It keeps doing it every day because he says so. The power of his word sustains it. And, and he sees that, and thus he's, he's moved to join that worship. Look at verse 1 again. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. His introductory words, O Lord, our Lord, utilized two of the names of God. Uh, it, you, uh, he utilizes Yahweh, and he utilizes Adon, uh, which means Lord. 
Yahweh is the covenant name. When Moses said, well, Lord, who am I supposed to tell when I ask? Who sent me? Uh, I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, he took a little convincing, but I'm amazed Moses is going to go. I, you just think about being told that you need to go and sue for an audience before the most powerful man in the world and tell him that I'm here as God's representative and you're going to have to let all these people go that you've been working for nothing because the Lord wants them out to, do, to worship him. Now think about that. Uh, this guy's surrounded by a bodyguard, a, a highly trained, highly skilled people, that all he's got to do is just nod, and you're going to cease to be. And Moses went. Uh, and uh, why? Because Yahweh sent me. And uh, so he uses two names, and it suggests the, the position and the authority of, of our Lord. Uh, the second of those two names has the suffix our added to it. And so the one, as I say, addresses the covenant God made with Israel, one whose authority and leadership are supreme, the God who is not the force, like the Star Wars, and I enjoy Star Wars, but God's not the force. He's somebody. He has a personality. And this somebody is also referred to quite aptly in scriptures, El Shaddai, Almighty, the Almighty God. And, um, and so he sees that and he, it, it indicates in the, the names that he uh, uh, attaches to him a recognition of his power, of his personality, and yet he's transcendent beyond. So he's all those things. And he ends this first line with the words, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, it is to be revered. It is to be respected by every human being and every living creature. Sometimes, you know, we get uh, just a bit flippant, it seems to me. I remember being in Long Beach, Mississippi at a worship service, and the guy that got up to lead singing had on some shorts and a big old hairy-legged thing and uh, some flip-flops. And I, my daddy would have said it out loud, I guess he thinks that's pretty. Um, I did not uh, reflect my daddy in that, but I thought it. And he had on a T-shirt that said, begging. Can you go to heaven doing that? I, I, I suspect you can, but it sure did look flippant to me. That's just one old country preacher, but it looked flippant to me. You know, if I come before the Lord, I'm going to lease, I'm going to quote old Herschel again, I'm going to reach off and run a comb through my hair. Why? Because he is El Shaddai. Because he is Adonai. He is Elohim. He is Yahweh. And, and so he's got about 190 names because there's no one name that contains can contain the concept of the one that we serve, the one who spoke it to be, the one who sustains it all the time. Yes, Brother Townley. How excellent is your name, the New King James Bible says. And indeed it is. And see, we tend to use and not criticize what we do necessarily, but the Hebrews had a different concept about the name. You know, for us, that's just a designation by which we're called. And so you can know your mama when she calls your name that it's time for you to go to supper, maybe not all the kids in the neighborhood, right? And so uh, name, the name in uh, the way the Hebrews thought about it um, pulls together all the attributes of God contained within that. And that's what they're referring to. This first line, how majestic is your name in all the earth. His name is the most noble. It is the most glorious. It is the most exalted name in heaven or earth. And it should therefore be revered and respected by everyone. The psalmist uses that name in that typical uh, uh, Old Testament way. Uh, not just simply a designation but something representing the deity, the divine. And heavy symbolism in this name. Well, this, this is a prophecy. It's not literally in the text of prayer. 
Absolutely. Hallowed be your name. Our earlier brethren uh, here, they sang prayers. I mean, yes, it's a psalm, as you correctly pointed. It's a psalm, but you can pray that. And you can pray it in song. Uh, because, and I know you've all had that. You know, when you stand and look at God's mountains, or look at uh, Old Man River in, on the border of Mississippi, between Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, you, you, you look upon the, the sea and see all of that teeming with life and, and moving and, and just being what it is. It calls forth for that, doesn't it? And so the psalmist uh, would sing that kind of praise and give thanks to God all in one. And of course, Don's point is that sometimes we can just start in uh, and, uh, and maybe miss that part of it. And we ought not to deny ourselves or him that because he deserves that, doesn't he? Um, our son was going to a place when he was uh, with the DA's office in, in Lubbock, and he was in a congregation. And a guy gets up, called upon to leave prayer, and he gets up and he says, Hey, Dad. That's the way it led in that prayer. And he, of course, Jacob said, Man, my head came up. And I looked around. And so then the preacher got up and thanked him for sharing his intimate relationship with the Lord and that he too had once been a Pharisee, but he wasn't anymore. And he said, about that time I'm hitting the door. You know, I don't, I don't got in the wrong bunch here. Sign says one thing, but that kind of irreverence towards the Almighty said, I, I'm not, I'm not going to take that. And so... Left it with them and found a good place to go. But uh, you know, we want to handle we want to handle very respectfully the name of the Lord. And uh, this this uh, the writer says that His name is majestic throughout all the earth. And of course, he he's referring to His wisdom and His power and His covenant keeping. You know, whenever you see a rainbow, what does that mean? Still means I'm not going to destroy the world by water anymore. Did that one time, it's not going to happen. And that pro has that promise been broken? It's flooded in localities and what have you, but has the whole world been flooded since then? And so that's covenant keeping. You get up every morning and you go, take in a big breath of fresh air. Who did that? See, our little planet, our little blue planet that is at it uh, in a kind of a tucked away protected galaxy hanging in that Goldilocks zone, they call it, that will sustain life as we know it, protected no doubt by him. Uh, all of that's covenant keeping. When he's promised that he's going to take care and, and, and do for his people, that he's mindful of his people throughout the created world. You know, you pet, pitch a... Uh, a line in where I'm from, and it's got a piece of shrimp and a piece of most anything that's edible, and you don't know what you're going to hook. There's all kind of stuff out there. Most of it you can eat. I had a friend that served on a destroyer in the Navy, and he said we we would uh, uh, we asked the skipper if we could set out some trolling rods, and uh, he said okay, you know if we just just patrolling. Said Man, we'd when we're off, we'd get out there and fish. The cook said you get something good to eat, I'll cook it. You know. So they ate fresh fish uh, on a fairly regular basis. And who did that? Who provided that? God did. Yes, sir. That rainbow is a little different than what it says right next to you. Yeah. And God's promise, he makes it plain. He sure does. Uh, Herschel pointed out here just a little, little, little while ago that 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 rainbow promise uh, and that rain, people are thinking about that. You, you ought to see my yard right now. 
When I left, it was near about deader than a hammer. And that water hit it, and guess what? Standing up and green. I mean, it looks, looks all right. Uh, and who did that? Well, God did. And y'all know, we've got agricultural people here, that water that, that God puts on it is a lot better than that stuff's got chlorine and all that in it. A lot better. It's like rocket fuel on plants. Uh, and so the, all of that is his covenant keeping. Uh, our Lord, how gloriously you are manifested by your creation and the world and man. That's what, that's what ought to come forth from us. God's exalted nature should be recognized by all because he displays it, David says, in the splendors of the heaven. I mean, go, go outside when it's dark and look up. Just look at it. Uh, you know, when you look at that, that it, somebody did that. And not only did somebody do it, but somebody who spoke, and it was. That's, if, if you'll take time to try to grasp some of that, that's pretty, that's pretty heady stuff. And it's difficult to translate into English this phrase, he displayed his splendor above the heavens. It's hard to get that into English, but what the psalmist is saying is that he put his glory in the heavens by his creation of them by his sustainment of them for a number of purposes. And they reflect his nobility. They reflect his grandeur. They reflect his magnificence On the, to anybody that looks at it. Now, the first reason given for praising God, the glory of the heavens, uh, out of, uh, he, he, re, he reminds us, or it reminds us, I should say, of some of the words of an old philosopher named Immanuel Kant. He said, two things fill the mind with ever-renewed wonder and reverence, the starlit heavens above me and the moral law in me. That's pretty deep thought. You look at that, it, it, it speaks of God. And then you look at the crowning of his creation, the only creature about which he said is made in my image. And you look at him, and, and he everywhere you go in the world, there's a sense of right and wrong, a sense of oughtness. This ought to be rather than that. Now, man has, in some case, degenerated, in some case, elevated, and they've got different ideas about what that are, but everybody's got a sense of what's right and what's wrong. Now, dog doesn't. I like dogs, but, you know, they're just going to be a dog. I had one in the airport yesterday, a little beagle hound uh, customs officer was there doing a dope sweep. And then that little guy was just, he was working. Of course, they don't want you trying to pet it or anything because he's, he's doing his business, you know. But that, uh, about that tall. But anybody knows anything about a beagle hound, beagle hound got a nose. And if you got any dope in that suitcase, you don't want to see that little beagle coming because you fix to get busted, you know. Uh, but Man is, is, is God's apex. Look at uh, verse 2. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Now, what's he talking about? Well, the marvelous heavens, the visible, the natural revelation of God, comprise one of his most notable declarations of his genius and his power. Uh, it, and it is as if David is saying the glory, the greatness, the majesty of Yahweh are splashed across the heavens like, in, like vivid shades of paint in the hands of an artist. I mean, there it is. Open your eyes. And it's a great masterpiece. And he's acknowledging God as a great artist You're in his fingers, if you will, as the brushes. But the psalm doesn't stop with the heavens. And that, that's a pretty uh, commanding testimony, isn't it? In the school language, you call that the cosmological argument. You, you know, if you want to impress the guy down to, at Brooks Brothers at the coffee clutch, say something to him about the cosmological argument. And uh, uh, what is that? Well, that's just look around you. And that's evidence. 
And sometimes we'll just stumble over the most, you know, the most visible evidence, right? Well, but he doesn't stop there. He refers further to the great and the small, the mighty and the frail, the seemingly little things, that is, infants and nursing babies, are used as additional evidence of God's majesty. You know, people are hollering because the Supreme Court has given back to the states, that's all they did, gave back to the states the regulation of abortion. And as it's practiced here, it is where you spend, I don't know what it costs now, two or three hundred dollars for somebody to kill your baby. Oh, don't say it like that, Brother Mitchell. That's what it is. You know, when, when can we not speak truth? Since when do we not speak truth? That's what he calls us to. That's what that is. And to euphemize and call it something else to try to lessen the impact of it, that's what it is. Because in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, Elohim said, El Shaddai said, I knew you before you were formed in the womb. I knew you. And he was, Jeremiah was ensouled by God. Jeremiah's mother and daddy came together in their embrace of intimate love, but God granted the life. See, and granted your life and granted everybody else's life. And, and so every little baby that you see is a manifestation of the grandeur and the glory of God. Every one of them. Every little calf that's born, every little, little chick that comes uh, from the egg, every little young thing when life perpetuates itself, that's God working. And so he recognizes that. And he said, you know, uh, Jesus uses uh, that expression about the mouth of infants and nursing babes. He quotes that in, uh, in Matthew 21, verse 16, telling us that the weakest and the most helpless human beings, babies, testify of the existence and the character of God. You know, I've only been present where two babies were born, mine, but that is an incredible thing. When you, I mean, that, all, uh, that doctor is there in case something goes wrong, which it occasionally does, but basically it's mama and what God has ordained. You know, and when that little baby is born and you can watch that umbilical cord, he goes from assist from mama Independent. Just does that because that is a decree of God. And I've seen that. That's amazing. I mean, he changes the way that he, that he, that he gets his oxygen. He cha you know, all that just shifts over and it's just in a moment. And so those, every one of those little babies is an expression of the greatness and the grandeur of God. And through their presence... Their instincts, their capacities, their development, their ability to learn and to love, their beauty, their attractiveness, their teachableness, their eagerness to believe, they declare the maker's praise. And little children are not prejudiced, and they are ready to believe in the one that brought them here. Uh, you, have to, you have to do a lot of misinformation and misteaching to convince a child otherwise. Faith in God comes to them easy. And they're close to him. You know, when is a man most like God? A moment after the doctor pats his little chest and he takes his breath. He is absolutely pure, pristine, and innocent. Uh, Godlike, created in the image of El Shaddai himself. And so, through that baby, God speaks very, through that helpless little infant, he speaks powerfully uh, to make his presence known and his words to make the enemy and the revengeful cease or emphasize that God uses even, a, even his enemies, uh, even those infants, to even shut their mouths. I remember a fellow that's a little bit different, but was talking about, give me one reason to believe in God. And all the guy said was Jews. Because people have been trying to exterminate them for centuries. And they're still Jews. 
And God said that he would not allow them to just be. And Hitler did his worst to try to get that done. Didn't get it done, did he? And so the promise of God was fulfilled. His words make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Uh, he creates a Sabbath rest for their criticism. In other words, it yeah, yeah, uh, slaps them back and they just go away for a while. And so the, the thought of a child should lead the avenger to cease his opposition and join in the praises of God. That ought to call, forth from, uh, call praise forth from his heart. I give you an example of that, and you you know what it was, Pharaoh's daughter. She's a pagan princess. She doesn't know the God of heaven at all, but she's created in the image of God, just like everybody else is. And then there's a little old baby, and the bull rushes by the Nile River, floating in a little ark that his mama made, and he's crying. She couldn't resist that. That motherly instinct, if you want to call it that, 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 that the just way women are. Can I say women? Is it okay to say women as opposed to men? Last time I checked, God made two genders, and that was all he made. And so when that little baby cried, Pharaoh's daughter took that child and looked upon him, and he was what? Ugly little kid. No, he was fair. He was a beautiful child. What did she do? She adopted that child on the spot. She raised him in Pharaoh's palace. She heaped upon him the, the riches and, and everything that Egypt had to offer and saw to it that he got as good an education as is possible for a man to get in the world at that time. Why? Well, because... God displayed his glory in that baby like he does in every baby. And she was, her eyes were not blind and she saw it and she, she responded uh, to that. So from babies, he says, you have established strength because of your adversaries. And these little ones bring praise from the hearts and minds of men. And it does, doesn't it? You ever been to a nursery and seen a family, you know, as they're trying to welcome a little baby? That's a pretty touching thing. Uh, you ever have an opportunity to see the doctor lay that baby in, in his mother's arms for the first time? That's, that's a touching thing, man. I, as we used to say, I jerk a tear out of a glass eye. And so Pharaoh's daughter and that baby grew, and he grew to be quite a man, didn't he? And he led God's people out of bondage in Egypt. And there again, Moses, at the time that he, he went back to the palace, he went back to kind of what was home ground to him. Everybody knew who he was. And so when he and Aaron made God's demands, they, uh, ultimately God had to, uh, had to soften old Pharaoh up, didn't he? He wasn't going to do it until those plagues, and all the plagues that were sent against the Egyptians demonstrated God's power over the alleged gods that they worshipped, their pantheon. And in essence, what God was doing was slapping each one of them down, you know. And he's finally, man, he's got nothing left, and he lets them go. And so that, and it, that all grew out of that one baby. God and his concern for man. Look at verses 3 through 5. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which ha you have ordained, yet uh, 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 ordained, what is man that you take you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and majesty. Some translations, King James Bible does, and others do translate a little lower than the angels because the language, uh, what it says is Elohim. And Elohim is plural, God plural. But in the ancient Hebrews often used the plural to kind of like emphasis, you know, not just God, but God. And uh, it's legitimate to translate it here as 
God, meaning all that he is, um, could go, at, you, you know, you could translate it either way, but I, that's, uh, we want to be aware of how they used it. And the writer sees God's greatness in the world above him. He sees God's greatness in the world around him. He sees God's greatness in the world within him. He sees the heavens as the work of God's fingers. There's only four other passages in Scripture that mention the fingers of God, Exodus 8, 19, Exodus 31, 18, Deuteronomy 9, 10, Luke 11, and 20, and here. And that is an anthropomorphic statement. What in the world does that mean? Man is anthropos. And so to attribute to God human characteristics to help us understand. He doesn't have fingers like we have fingers, literally fingers. But he, he is able to do the intricate work that we do with fingers. And so that's, that's the way sometimes that he is described. Uh, now, if we get on the other side and he says, Lindell, come here. What do you see? And I say, fingers, Lord. Uh, then I'll, you know, but I, I think what he's talking about is to do that intricate work that he does. He's like us, but he's more than what we are. And when we get on the other side, what? We'll be like him, won't we? And we'll be able to see him as he is because we'll be like he is. Uh, right now in the flesh, there's some limitation put on that. But he sees the, the, the heavens as the work of his fingers. And then he comes to verse 4. And, you know, all that, the, the stars and the moon, all that ordained or put in place. And he's overwhelmingly driven to this profound question in verse 4. What is man that you take thought of him? I mean, He's asking, you know, what is the son of man that God would care for him? He uses two designations for man, both of which emphasize the frailty of humanity. He uses the words uh, enosh, and the second word is ben adam. And that just means son of man, ben, son, or son of, and adam, son of man. And so his point must be, when I see the grandeur of the heavens, when I take in the magnificence of the stars, the moon wrapped in a golden light, I must ask myself, why does God give any, con uh, any consideration at all to weak and frail men who are smaller than a speck of dust in his universe? And yet he knows every one of them, and he cares for them. The King James, as I said, has a, in this parallel land, visiteth him in the place of, art mindful of him. Well, it means basically the same thing. The word uh, pakad can mean visit. Uh, it can mean appoint, number, care for. Obviously, the question is, how such an almighty, all-powerful, everlasting God could condescend, come down to care for such a feeble being as a human? And that's a, yeah, I told you, that's a profound thought. And you're going to go on over to the New Testament, Romans 5 and verse 8, and Paul says, and while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, died for us. And that's kind of an extension on the thought here. David said, when, we, when I think about the Lord that did all this, and the Lord that, that creates these innocent little ones, and I think about all of that, and I think, why are you mindful of us? I mean, well, here we are, there again. They tell me, people are supposed to be smart, say, that we're kind of off in a, a protected neighborhood in the universe. Kind of a quiet place. In a zone that will sustain life as we know it. And, of course, if you read about that very much, you know that the balances and what have you on, on the planet, the, the tolerances are, are, I mean, it's very precisely done. It's not like you can just go in there and start messing around with what God has done. You better leave it balanced like you balanced it. Because when you, we see that now with some of the things that man has done. When you, when you start uh, moving stuff and changing things that God has put in place, 
what is that typically work out very well? See, if you don't stay within those perimeters, you start having problems. And some of them get, get pretty bad pretty quick. You know, they learned if you cut down all the trees, what's going to happen when it rains again in California? The hills are going to just run down in your house. You better leave some trees there to hold the soil. You know, just, just you say, well, that's common sense. Well, and, but not too common. If you put concrete in a flat plain, you put concrete everywhere, what happens when the water comes? Yeah, it doesn't have anywhere to run off, does it? The ground can't. Uh, can't absorb it. So you got people uh, trying to save their neighbors down in Houston and their house is all underwater. What happened? Well, you put concrete everywhere. Well, right? I mean, I'm not mad at anybody for put it, putting it there, but you, you know, you need to think about that stuff because when it, the way God designed it is when it rains, the land absorbs that. Well, if there's, <laughs> you know, oh man. Uh, Dr. Dow Flat used to say that his daddy always told him that he liked to go to the zoo and watch monkeys till he discovered people. Uh, so that you know they're just funny, and there, there, there's some truth to that. The Son of Man, uh, that you're mindful of Him. Verse five, as he ponders this truth, uh, he concludes that man is made a little lower than God, and a crowned with glory and majesty. Well, if man is made a little lower than God, then we ought to respect each other, shouldn't we? And respect that, that life that God created as much as we can. And we should move against that life unless we have some compelling reason, safety reason to do so. Uh, the word employed here, Elohim, as is, is I've said, is that plural word. And probably what he's stressing here is that that plural of majesty. Uh, and his point being that God has, has made man a little lower than himself. Now the Septuagint translation, like I say, uses the word angels, probably because they are interpreting that plural, uh, that plurality to mean divine beings, because there is an angelic order in there. Uh, but all through the Psalm, he's been talking about God the Creator. God said at the dawn of time, in Genesis 1, 26, do you know what he said? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So everybody you see is made in the image of God. And when they were born a little baby, they were born innocent. Uh, you say, well, there's mean people out there. Yeah, but they weren't born that way. There's decisions that they've made, and you, you can get there. You can make yourself a child of the devil if you want to, uh, but you weren't born that way. You were created in the image of God, in his likeness. And only, only man of all the living creatures that God created, only to man did he say, I have made you in my image. By the time he messes here today, he lives down in Florida. We were talking about, you know, we've gone down to Anna Maria Island. You can see manatee down there. They're fascinating creatures to me. Just fascinating creatures. Big, huge creature. And the only way he's probably going to hurt you is by accident. If you get up too close. When they're in distress, they'll flap their tail like, as if to say, stay away. Now, if he used to hit you with that, that'd probably hurt a whole lot. But they don't attack people. They don't attack anything, but it just it's part of that intricate thing. And uh, you can see schools of dolphin out there like I used to see when I was a kid. And uh, when we were there, we saw a school of stingray that was probably miles long. I didn't know they ever gathered like that. I just own and on and on as that ocean was churning, had a little storm out in the Gulf, and there's a lot of activity that's going on. And so there are a lot of just unique and incredible creatures that he's made, but he said to one, I made you in my image. Now, if I'm made in the image of God, I ought to behave myself, shouldn't I? I ought to try to reflect what he put in me, and I ought to seriously try to be a member of my family. You know, the text of Scripture says, you know, what you do reflects on your mama, 
right? And it also reflects on your heavenly father. And so when people that are oppositional to Christianity raise objections because they see some of us acting bad, you know, we don't just need to blow that off, do we? We need to take a corrective and try to reflect uh, our father. The fact that man was made a little lower than God is more raising, uh, amazing to the writer and should be to us than even the starry heavens and the harvest moon and the seasons and what have you that come and go and change. And that canopy that he displays every night, even more magnificent in that, than that, is that he says to humanity, I made you in my image. In verses 6 through 8, God and the rule of man is talked about. He said, you make him to rule over the works of your hands and, and you've put all things under his feet and all sheep and oxen and the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and whatever passes through the paths of the sea. And so he continues to consider uh, God and he's, and he's struck with great wonder that God not only cares for man, but he's given man great authority and majesty, hadn't he? You know, there's some folks today, I, I want to take care of the earth. I, when he gave us authority and majesty, he didn't say tear it up as fast as you can. And so I'm, I'm all for, I was a conservationist before they had environmentalism, that we ought to take care of, try to keep the water clean, you know, just take good care of what God is letting us use. Uh, it's, if we have that, that authority, he made man to rule over the works of his hands. But they're his things. And uh, I talked about that, and a lot of you have done that. When we went down to Florida, we rented somebody else's house, went to other folks' house. Well, how, do you, how, do you, how should you act when you're other folks' house? Try to tear up everything you can, leave with all the towels and, and all that? You know, you know, to say that is to answer it. You want to leave it like you found it. You want to respect it. Why? Because somebody lovingly put that there for you and let you use it. Well, I paid rent, okay, but you still ought to, ought to respect what is there. And we ought to respect what he's put in, in our grasp because all this is his territory. And again, you come back to this idea, man, a mere speck in the universe is to be Lord over God's earth. That's what, he, that's what the Lord said. Here it is. Use it. Care for it. Uh, it provide for your families. Provide for your community. Use these things. The animals of the field, the wild animals of the earth, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, whatever else there may be in the depths of the sea, Genesis 1.28. And so the description of the oversight given to man is not intended to be phrased in modern scientific language. He's, he's painting an overall picture, and he's saying what's there I've put in man, at man's disposal. I've crowned him with glory. I've crowned him with majesty. He reflects me, and I have entrusted him with my earth. Now, go forth and multiply. Take care of it. Once again, verse 9, as he ends, O Lord, our Lord. See, there's that call to worship. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You made man. You made the stars and the moon, and all those wondrous things. You made all of this. You made the little babies that come into the world that replenished the, 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 the race. And you sustain all of that, and then you made us in your image and entrusted all that to us in the management of that. We ought to take care of it, shouldn't we? Uh, I think some of those people go overboard personally in the environmental movement, but I don't. at the same time, I don't sneer at somebody that, that says we ought to take care. My father-in-law's a man I, I admired for so many reasons, but there's no telling how much money he spent in his lifetime dealing with the, stopping erosion, digging pools for the cattle. But, you know, when the cattle got something to drink, guess what? Every kind of critter that runs in that country got something to drink. So that rancher's inadvertently caring for all of those creatures because there's all, I mean, it's just birds and bobcats and raccoons and possums and rabbits and there's all, you know, a, a little rabbit and a jackrabbit and, you know, armadillos and everything. And it cares for it. And then it cares for you. You give to the land, the land gives to you. 
uh, that's God working. Well, I'm glad we had a chance to look at Psalm 8 this morning. It is a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. It, that's a good devotional read, to read that and think about what's being said in that piece of work, that piece of Scripture. God bless you for this day. It's good to be with you. Good to be anywhere.